Well, find Philippians 4 and look at the very top of your hand out there. <clears throat> the title of this message is from Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We're going to see that very clearly in this study tonight. So let's just review for a minute. Look, uh, this is not on your notes, but look in your Bibles. Look at Philippians 4, chap chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, everybody say, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. In other words, because of what our Lord has accomplished in our salvation, we can stand firm in Him. And he said it in that verse. He says, in this way, which is Paul's example. Once again, in prison, about to be executed. And what's he doing? He's standing firm in the Lord. In other words, Jesus' perfectly righteous life, which he lived as a man, brings to us perfect righteousness before God as well. He earned what we needed, and that righteousness has been imputed to every single believer. Everybody say, thank God for righteousness. But that isn't all he did. He also died at the cross in his sacrificial death where he bore our sin. He not only provided for us a perfect righteousness, he provided for us a perfect sacrifice so that our sin could be removed as far as the east is from the west. And that is, once again, bearing all of our sin and then imputing to us a perfect righteousness. It's not done there either. Because right now, he's our eternal high priest, seated at God's right hand, interceding for his people, who are referred to in this passage as the redeemed of the Lord. Aren't you glad that you belong to the Lord? Redeemed means he bought your sorry soul. And he owns you. You know how he bought it? With the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad I belong to him. Oh, my goodness. I didn't do this. He did this. That's an awesome thing. Everybody say, I am one of the redeemed of the Lord. So I'm going to look at verses 2 and 3 back in, in review. Philippians 4, 2 and 3. I urge Aodia and I urge Sintiche to live in harmony in the Lord. These two ladies had been fighting. Verse 3. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. How many know we're supposed to get along? I'm looking at John right here. We're supposed to get along with our eternal church family. Everybody say love God and love each other. In other words, we need to be working together on spiritual things. Now look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> He's in prison. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. That's a great verse right there. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Now the result of that prayer, verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How many know we need the peace of God in the day in which we live, do we not? And that's available to every single Christian. So joy is a fruit of the Spirit that is in every believer's life, as is peace, and we should be rejoicing in the Lord. Paul's example, once again, in Roman prison, awaiting execution, and here he is talking about joy and peace. And what does he say in verse 5? He says, your gentle spirit... He's talking here because he's about ready to talk about these two ladies that have been fighting, but he's talking about believers should be reasonable. In other words, in every believer's life, we need to be walking together with one another. Everybody say, in the Lord. That is so important. And then the last verse, verse 5, he says, once again, the Lord is near. Aren't you glad the Lord is near both in time? He could come tonight. But guess what? He's also near in space. Because Jesus said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, what? There I am in your midst. He's here right now. Wow, what an awesome Savior we have. So now let's look back in our text, Philippians 4, let's start in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell or meditate or think on these things. So now look on your notes. Finally, is the conclusion on spiritual stability, that first word in verse 8. Paul's key to this stability is dwell on these things. Spiritual stability is a result of how a person thinks. I probably should have said how a Christian thinks, because that's really what it's all about here. In other words, renew your mind 
to God's Word. Keep reading. The words dwell on mean to evaluate or to consider or think. In other words, proper Christian thinking should not be optional for us as believers. It's a command. It's an imperative. We should be doing, we should be dwelling on these things or at least striving to dwell on these things every day. Can you say amen? Because I tell you, we're all fighting the same battle right now. So keep reading. We are to consider the qualities Paul lists for the believer and dwell on them. In other words, be disciplined in your thinking regarding spiritual virtues. Do not be naive or foolish, and I could have used a lot of words here, or uninformed or ignoring spiritual values that are already yours as a follower of Christ Jesus. So keep reading. People's lives are to some degree the product of their thoughts. You've heard the expression garbage in, garbage out. And that actually has some truth in Scripture. On your notes there is Proverbs 23, 7, the first half of that verse. It says, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. New King James, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And this truth is repeated several times in our study tonight. Here's Mark 7. Notice these four verses. Jesus was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, all these evil things proceed from within and defile. I mean, no, we should be careful what we're watching on TV and what we do with our computers. That was a pretty weak amen there. I'm not going to give you another chance yet. But sad, in our day, the question is not, is it true? The question really is, how's it going to make me feel? And that's not the right kind of question. The error is, truth is whatever works? No. Jesus said on your notes, John 14, 6, he said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We need to focus on what he has said in his word and keep our eyes on him one way or another. Keep reading. Christians must renew their minds and think biblically. How do you renew your mind? You read the scripture with your, actively, with your mind actively engaged, endeavoring to employ and walk in the light of what you see in the scripture. That's really all it is. That's thinking biblically. So as followers of Christ Jesus, our concern must be whether it is true to scripture or not. That's very important. Next little example of this is the Berean Christians. Acts 17, 11 refers to them in this one verse. He said, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, these Bereans, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They would look in the scripture to see if the things they were hearing were correct. And so it says they were more noble-minded than the believers in Thessalonica. So look back on your notes again. Do not base your life on emotions or feelings. Be a biblical thinker, read those words out loud now, and renew your, that's how you renew your mind is with the scriptures. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, look at these verses. That in reference to your former manner of life, before you were born again, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you do that? With the scripture. And put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. So on your notes again, repeatedly in Scripture, all the way both old and new, God commands us, everybody say, to think. And I probably should have said to think scripturally, to think of what's in the light. That's what God leads us to every day. Isaiah 118, notice what the prophet writes. He's, the, the Lord is speaking through the prophet. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Aren't you glad that your sins have been forgiven? Including your sins of bad thinking. Matthew 16, look at these verses. It says, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now they were corrupt. And Jesus said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Now notice this. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? How are we going to discern the signs of the times? Be people of the word of God. 
If you're not reading your Bible in the week, you need to start doing it this week. You need to start tomorrow morning. Well, I go to work at 6, then get up at 4.30. It's a good thing. It's what changed my life back in the early, early 80s. It'll change your life as well. Can you say amen? So back on your notes. God has given us the scripture, and he expects us to renew our minds to his truth. Keep reading. Scripture defines the unsaved mind, the person outside of Christ, as depraved, which is morally corrupt and wicked. Now, Romans 1.28, put that up there and leave it up there. Let's read it one time through, though. And just as they did not see fit to not acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. You probably have read it with a reprobate mind. It's the same thought there. To do those things which are not proper. So leave that up there. In other words, Romans 8, 7 on your notes talks about these people, the unsaved, they are hostile to God. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 describes them as foolish. They do not understand spiritual things. 2 Corinthians 3, 14, the unsaved mind is hardened to spiritual truths. But now keep reading on your notes. But when you come to Christ Jesus in faith, God gives you what he requires. Thank God. He gives you an understanding of the gospel he gives you a repentant heart. That wasn't you that did that. He did that through the gospel. And he gives you the faith to believe the gospel and to be born again. I tell you what, I'm so glad God gives that which he requires. However, look on your notes, the next little line there, the transformation of our minds is not an event. It's a lifelong process. I've been doing this all my life, and so have many of you. Guess what? We're not done yet. We'll be done when Jesus appears or when we go to be with him. But until then, we need to be at work renewing our minds to the scriptures. Can you say amen? Let's look at our memory verses one more time. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now read verse 2 with me out loud. Here's our memory verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable. It doesn't just say your mind is going to be changed. It says you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. My goodness, my goodness. Colossians 3, look at these two verses. Therefore, if you have been raised up, how many have been raised up with Christ tonight? Okay, if you're born again, that's you, okay? Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things <laughs> that are on the earth. So once again, look at verse 8 again in your Bibles. Let's look at it again. Here's the attributes of God's truth. Look at verse 8, Philippians 4, 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Everybody say honorable. honorable. In other words, worthy of respect. Whatever is right. What's that mean? It's talking about God's standard of righteousness. Whatever is pure, that would be morally clean, something that is holy. Whatever is lovely, that's not only attractive before God, but as a Christian, it's attractive to us, and we, are, we find it appealing because it's where we want to go because of the Spirit within us. Whatever is of good repute, in other words, highly regarded, and the last one is, if any excellence and worthy of praise, everybody say, dwell on these things. So now look at verse 9, Philippians 4, 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, here it is again, practice these things, and the God of peace will be, how many could use more peace in this season than you had last year? There's, our, there's, there's one good piece of advice for us to have peace in the midst of all this turmoil we're living in. Look at it again, verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, we're reading about right now, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. My goodness. So back on your notes, practice these things. Believers must be disciplined in order to add to their faith the proper attitudes, thoughts, and actions. And here on your notes is a quote from James 1.22. Here it is. But prove yourselves, read that word out loud, Doers, there's practice. Prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Keep reading. Here is the key to spiritual growth and contentment. Being a doer of the word. Result, the God of, everybody say peace, 
will be with you. We're all battling for peace right now, and the way we should be battling it is in a spiritual means and not in other ways. Can you say amen? The God of peace will be with you. Now look at verses 10 and 11 in your, in, in your Bible. Philippians 4, 10 and 11. He says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. He had just received the offering that Epaphroditus had brought. He says, Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. So look at your notes. Verse 10, the secret to contentment. This is in the context of Paul's troubles at this time. Let's remember that, so keep reading. What does God provide his children with to give them contentment? Question? Well, one answer is from Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs. It's on your notes, and this is what he writes. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly instruction in every condition. Everybody say, I could use more of that. And I know I've read this 14 times, probably today alone, by Jeremiah, and every time I read it, I'm thinking, Lord, I could use more of that. Let's read it one more time. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly instruction in every condition. Now keep reading on your notes. Some principles needed for our contentment or our peace as believers. On your notes, that little bullet point, the context of Philippians 4.10. I'm read it to you again. He says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Speaking of this offering they had sent. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Now keep reading. Read that little paragraph there, the context of Philippians 4.10. It was 10 years since support had been sent by the church in Philippi to the apostle. But Epaphroditus arrived in Rome, Paul's in prison, with support from the Philippian believers. We read that back in the 18th verse. It's been 10 years, but yet they revived their concern for Paul. So keep reading. Now Paul's attitude reflects his patient confidence in God's sovereignty and providence. How many know 10 years hearing nothing and then you hear something and you rejoice? That's patient confidence. I tell you what, that's awesome. Can you say amen to that? Paul's attitude reflects his patient confidence in God's sovereignty and providence. Proverbs 16, 9. The mind of man plans his way, read it out loud, <laughs> Aren't you glad you're not in charge? Boy, would you mess it up if you were. I mean, you would be, well, I've got an example in my notes of who's in charge, and that's God, and it's Joseph on your notes there. Joseph certainly understood God's providence. Now, don't put that slide up just yet from Genesis 50, because I've got some things on my notes I want to read. You remember, back in Genesis 45, Joseph was sold by his brothers to an Egyptian slave trader. You remember that? They threw him in the, in the pit, you know, and sold him to the slave trader that came by. And Joseph was taken to Egypt, where he was sold as a slave. He was there 17 years. 17 years as a slave before his family came to Egypt. So let me read you Genesis 45. I got my finger here because I scribbled all over my notes here. Listen to these verses, 45 verse 4. So the brothers have now come to Egypt because the famine is, is horrible. They know that there's some, some supplies in Egypt. They're coming to try to get some supplies, not knowing that Joseph is in charge of all these supplies. So Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. Remember, it's been 17 years. And he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Listen, for God sent me before you to preserve life. I tell you, he had the exact understanding of what was happening here. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you by throwing me into that pit and selling me to that slave trader. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Then Joseph says, hurry and tell my daddy that I'm okay. That's the next verse. 
So we in Tucson should strive to understand God's providence. Joseph did. So now look at Genesis 50. I've got these two verses on a slide. This is later on. This is, this is five chapters later in Genesis. He's trying to reconcile these things now that the father has died. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me. Because they thought he was going to take his revenge on him now that daddy's died. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it. God meant it for good. My goodness, all the trouble that he went through, thrown into the pit, sold into slavery. Yes, God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. God, give me the faith that Joseph had to know that when I'm going through difficult seasons in my life, you are still in control. You're working your purposes in me and through me. Aren't you glad heaven rules in the affairs of men? So in Tucson, we should strive to understand God's providence, which I think is essential or crucial to our contentment. So go back to Philippians and let's look at verses 11 and 12. I want to read verse 10 again. I just love these, these, this verse 10. He says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Read verse 13 out loud. Do all things through him who strengthens me. We're going to read that again, but look at verse 11 and 12 on your notes. Paul was not a spoiled Christian. He lived and ministered in the trenches. Obviously, he's in prison. He was not a prosperity preacher, obviously. But he trusted God as he served God, and God always proves himself to be faithful to his people. Boy, amen to that. So verse 13 again, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So look on your notes at your conclusion. Verse 13, I can do all things refers to these hardships. Through it all, Paul was content in the Lord. Once again, in spite of his difficulties of Roman imprisonment awaiting execution. So now let's read verses 14 through 20 as we begin to wrap up. And let's finish this chapter. Verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. He's thanking them for this offering that they've sent. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit or the fruit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance, as he's in prison. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. That describes our giving as well, folks. Verse 19, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, in Christ Jesus. That's a verse nearly all of us can quote, but we need to understand the context. It's in the context of this church that sent an offering to the apostle in prison. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Verse 20. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Everybody say amen. Once again, in the midst of all these trials, Paul's concern is for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 19, give and it shall be given to you. Listen to Luke 6.38, listen. Give and it shall be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm talking about giving here. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Those are the words of Jesus concerning our giving, and Paul certainly is kind of echoing the same thoughts. Now keep reading. Paul's closing remarks are clearly addressed to the saints. Let me read verses 21 and 22 as we get near the end of the chapter. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That was some of the imperial guard that had gotten saved, guarding Paul. 
My goodness, a saint is someone on your notes, a saint is someone who has been saved and separated to God for his purposes. Here is Jesus' work of redemption. Saints of God or saints of Christ Jesus describes every genuine believer. If you're a Christian, say, I am a saint. That doesn't mean you're perfect. What it does mean is that the one who saved you is perfect and he's going to perfect, perfect his work in you before it's all over, but you're a saint now. Let me ask you another question. How many of you would say that you are, I'm going to ask, it's a trick question, okay? How many of you would say that you are as righteous as God is? Raise your hand if that's you. Ooh. Can I tell you what? Listen, you are clothed right now, this is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, you are clothed with the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why Luther called it from without. He called it an alien righteousness. So let me ask the question again now. How many of you as Christians are as righteous as God? That's every Christian. It's not what you've earned. It's not what you've done. It's what Christ earned and what he did for us. We come to him. He clothes us with this perfect, that is a mind blower. But you know what? It's absolutely biblical truth. It's Jesus' work of redemption. You are a saint of Jesus Christ. So verse 22, he says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household, on your notes. Shows us even some of the Praetorian Guard were led to faith in Christ by Paul. Verse 23, the last verse of the book here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So look on your notes, bottom of the page, verse 23. The resource we need most, and this is true for every one of us, is the grace that comes from our Lord Jesus. Here is our empowerment not only to live a godly life, but also to fulfill God's purposes in us as soldiers of the cross. Paul speaks to the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 6.1, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. His point is that our lives should reflect our heavenly citizenship the Holy Spirit lives in every single believer. It has nothing to do with whether or not you speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit is in every believer, and every believer is salt. You're a preserving influence around you, and your light illuminating the darkness that is around you with the gospel. So turn to 2 Corinthians 5. I don't have this on my notes, but I think we should read it since we're a little confused about righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5. This is a verse probably 20, 25 years ago, that absolutely changed my life. I was raised Assembly of God. My dad was the pastor of the church. We had no understanding of, really, the righteousness that is given to us as believers. So every, every weekend service, usually Sunday nights, there would be an altar call, and if you'd sinned in that week pre previously, then you better come up here and pray, because otherwise the rapture may happen on Monday, and you're going to get left behind. That's kind of the mentality. So we got saved week after week after week after week. But you know what? That's not the way it works. How many of you fall short every week in one way or another? Okay, you didn't raise your hand, you just lied, okay? So you, you fell short this week, all right? So does that mean you've not forfeited your salvation? Of course not. So look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We're going to read 17 through 21. Here it is. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I hope that's everybody in the room that's a Christian, he or she is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things, all these new things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's our job. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now read verse 21 out loud, out loud whatever Bible you have. Read it, here we go. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Let's read it together. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the cross at Calvary, the sin of all those that God would save. 
a world of sinners, literally, was put on Christ, punished by the Father, when Jesus said, my God, my, not Father, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was bearing our sin. He was bearing the wrath of God, which was the alienation from God, as it were, God turning his back on the Son who was bearing our sin. So Christian, guess what? Not only did he carry your sin from you as far as the east is from the west, he has given you, get this now, the righteousness that he earned as a man. Read verse 21 one more time. Let's read it out loud one more time before we quit. Here we go, verse 21. He, God made Jesus, okay, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Everybody say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. 